Yesterday, they're, they're not. Yesterday, <laughs> a lot of people. Well, there, <clears throat> there are. W welcome back, folks, and good morning on this brisk and comfortable day in Sun Valley. Uh, the world can change a lot in 24 hours, as we've discovered. Um, you know, there, yesterday afternoon, Justice Breyer really took us on a fascinating trip inside the Supreme Court, into the interior of the conversations, into this competing judicial philosophical conversation with pragmatism on the one hand and, of course, originalism and textualism on the other. And I, it occurs to me that that's a natural preamble to the conversation we're going to have today, which is about the court's relationship to the outside world in some sense, to the public, to politics, to the art of governance. And uh, we will, but we're going to be talking partly, by the way, about his 2021 book, which was The Authority of the Court and the Peril of Politics. But it's also an occasion to talk about these concepts like tradition and change and the legitimacy of the court itself, which is so very much on our minds these days. Uh, as everybody knows, the approval ratings for the Supreme Court are, are, uh, have dropped to near all-time lows. By the way, the only people lower, I, perhaps, are uh, members of Congress and journalists, so we're in good company together. Um, but it is a source of great concern to Justice Breyer, and I think he'll help us think through some of the ways that we can begin to repair public trust. Um, I will say just a couple of things that are uh, of, of note. Uh, you may or may not know Justice Breyer grew up in San Francisco, went to Stanford and to Oxford and to Harvard, and uh, he also spent importantly, and you'll hear a bit about this, time on Capitol Hill as chief counsel to the Judiciary Committee under Ted Kennedy, which has shaped some of his conception of how politics and consensus can work. And I will say in the pages of The New Yorker, my employer, he was described as careful but not hesitant, which is our most exuberant form of praise. <laughs> When he retired in 2022, he was succeeded by one of his former clerks, Katanji Brown Jackson. Please join me in welcoming Justice Breyer back to this <laughs> stage. I thought we would start um, for people who might be intimidated by the question of originalism and textualism and pragmatism with a uh, brief precis of, of what you talked about yesterday so that we have that as a foundation as we go out into this question of politics and so on. All right, this is a test. <laughs> Thank you. I like being here very much. It's, it's been fabulous. I mean, you meet people, everybody's interested in all kinds of different things and learn something. It's really good. So I did say some things yesterday. And uh, uh, I could give a test. Uh, I might flunk the test, but nonetheless, um, look, I want you to know what we do. And so to try to keep that in people's minds, those who were not here uh, and those who went off immediately and got lunch. And, uh, but uh, what do I explain to the seventh, uh, seventh graders when I'm talking to them? What, do I, what does an appellate judge do? And I, the story I tell them, which does keep it in their minds, is, is something I read on a, uh, in France on a train. It said it was in the newspaper. There was a, a biology professor, and the biology professor had 20 live snails in a basket. And... Uh, conductor came up and said, uh, you have a ticket for the snails. See, they weren't here yesterday, so they don't. <laughs> <laughs> the the, the, the uh, uh, ticket for the snails, that's crazy. What do you mean? He says, well, we read the fair book. The fair book says no animals on the train, uh, and if you, except in a basket, in which case you have to buy a half fair ticket. Snail. They're talking about dogs. They're talking about uh, cats or maybe rabbits or something, but certainly not snails. Well, he says, is a snail an animal? So I say to the seventh graders, that's a good question, isn't it? Is a snail an animal? Well, it's perfect for me because I don't have to say another word because they immediately start to argue. 
Some of them says they're going to have to pay a fare for a caterpillar, for a flea, for a mosquito, a fly. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, and the other said, well, is a snail an animal or not? And so they go on for about half an hour. And I say, well, all I have to say to this is that's what we do in the appellate courts, including the Supreme Court. I said, the word might not be snail. It might not be animal. It might be the freedom of speech. Or it might be a right to bear arms. But it's the same idea. How does that word apply? How do those words apply? Do they apply to this circumstance? If so, how? What do they mean? Now you know the job. Mm. Okay? And now, uh, why have I written this long book? Not too long. Mm. <laughs> Not the one we're talking about. I have about to say, as a moderator, you write books that we can absorb. It makes good. me very happy. That's it? good. That's good. And he means absorb by reading and not by putting it in the bathtub. <laughs> but the, the, the uh, um, uh, point is, uh, look, uh, there are different ways of, of, of going about this. I wanted to write the book because I've been a judge for 40 years, 28 years on the Supreme Court. And I thought, I'll write it down at least for myself. I must have learned something over those 40 years or the 28. And if people want to see and read it and what I think I've learned, fine, fine. But there was another reason. Oh, the other reason is there's this hurricane or typhoon that's come along uh, called uh, textualism or originalism. And what's that? In a sentence it says, here's how judges should answer this question, whether it's animals or the freedom of speech. Read the words. And Nino Scalia, who was a good friend, stop right there. Don't go further. Don't go into those things that Breyer often goes into. Who wrote those words and why? What was the purpose? What are the consequences if you decide this way or that way? Hmm. How does that fulfill or not fulfill the purpose? What are the values that those reflect? How do they fit in our Constitution's values? And uh, don't ask, there's no point in asking. That, that just confuses people. Just ask the words, and that's good enough. And if it's originalism, that applies to the Constitution. It's the same thing. It's because the words in the Constitution are more abstract, usually. And so you say, go back and look at who wrote those words and what did the average person who heard them think they mean at that time. So why should I do that? I said, why? He says, one, because it'll be easy. <laughs> You're easier. <laughs> Two, uh, because uh, you'll get the same results across the country, pretty much. Uh, three, because the Congress will know what to expect from the interpretations of what they write. And four, and perhaps most important, will prevent some of those judges that were around in the 20th century and sometimes before from substituting what they think is good for the country, for the law. I want to ask you a question about this very matter, this question of sort of what is durable, what is timeless, and what is specific to a period of, uh, in which we are operating and living. There's a, a, a comment that made a big impression on you uh, by Paul Freund, I think, who was the great late Harvard legal scholar, who said that a judge should be affected by let me get this right, that no judge should be affected by the temperature of the day, but every judge should be affected by the climate of the era. How do you distinguish between the two? I have to save that question because it's a very tough question. <laughs> I don't think we're going anywhere. I think it's okay. We can... I'll get there in a second. But I'd say there are two groups of people who really do not know why I think this textualism um, you know, originalism business is not going to get us anywhere. It's going to cause a lot of harm. And those are people who weren't here yesterday. Uh, and those are people who just don't like these series very much. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, words in the Constitution, the freedom of speech. When they wrote those words in 1787, 88, 89, and they were enacting them. People thought they meant something. Don't they mean the same thing? Just ask those people. It'd be a lot easier. Well, it's hard to ask them because they're not around. But nonetheless, um, hey, why isn't that good enough? So there are many reasons for that. But uh, one of them that I emphasize, Nino Scully and I used to 
discuss this a lot, and we go to uh, law schools like Lubbock, Texas, where there were. They thought there was a football game. We were in the football stadium, and there did were you fill a lot. the stadium the way that? Yeah, we football? did just about. So they were interested. That was great, and uh, they saw after this discussion that we were pretty good friends, which we were. So I would say to Nino, uh, you know, he was the one who said, just look back and see what it meant at the time and see what people thought it meant. And that's the end. Stop right there. Don't go further. And I'd say, you know, Nino, this gets getting to your question. Mm. George Washington didn't know about the Internet. No, good point. But Nino would say, you know, I knew that. <laughs> And then he'd say, a better joke than that, he'd say, a better story, is the two campers. What? The two campers are out there, one's putting on his running shoes, the other says, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? He says, well, he says, there's a bear in the camp. A bear in the camp? You can't outrun a bear. He says, yeah, but I can outrun you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You see, I'm not saying I have the best theory in the world. I just have a better one than you have. And he says, you know, Stephen, your theories of interpreting, you may say Holmes and these others did the same thing or tried to or whatever it was. It is so complicated, you're the only one who could do it. Meaning I can't do it. <laughs> but uh, I'd say, yeah, that may be. There may be something to complexity. That's true. But uh, I'll tell you, if we follow your theory, we're going to have a constitution nobody wants. Mm-hmm. And that's really what the debate's like. But there's another group of people who will say, Stephen, why did you bother writing this book? Why are you going around talking about uh, looking at what people meant when they wrote these words? Or uh, why, uh, uh, what will the consequences be? And look at that. And, or how does it fit within the values of democracy, human rights, uh, equality, uh, rule of law, and a lot of others. Uh, uh, separation of powers. Why do we look at all that? Why bother? It's all politics, really. Mm. Please. All politics. Right. That's what it is. So to that, I say, and it's really hard <clears throat> to convince the audience that it isn't. Because they expect me to say, no, it isn't. And then they think, ah, we knew you'd say that. <laughs> but, but it is all politics. So I say, no, wait. Wait a minute. Politics. And Paul Freund gives us the answer. Mm. But uh, before we get to Paul Freund, I did work for Senator Kennedy. I worked on the Judiciary Committee. And, uh, hey, suppose Senator Kennedy gets a call from the mayor of Worcester. And instantly, the same, another call from the Secretary of Defense. Which one will he take first? How many think the mayor of Worcester? How many think the Secretary of Defense? First group wins. It's not even close. It's not even close. Look, Worcester is filled with constituents. The Secretary of Defense is filled with tanks. One group goes to the polls, the other doesn't. That's politics. Am I going to get the Republicans to come to our executive session? And I'm going to be able to, who's, what's popular? What's the press going to say about this? And when you read the press, you spend three seconds. Mm. You should spend more. But when you read what they say for three seconds, what do you think is the right thing? And that's who you'll vote for. <laughs> that's politics. Do I find that in the Supreme Court? No. No, absolutely not. But I have to ask you, but, this, but, yeah. is, this is a real question here. Because, look, the fact is, as you know, public surveys have shown very consistently, and this is not abstract here. Here's one just from the last month from the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, a credible outfit found that seven out of 10 Americans believe that the justices are putting ideology or personal politics above impartiality. Mm -hmm. There are a host of reasons why people believe what they believe, but in the end, the court is the one that will bear the consequences, and I wonder what the court can do and must do to try to repair that public trust. That's the same question you just asked. It's about Paul Freund. Hmm. And I want to point out four things. Can I do that? I that, those, so. that word politics might mean before I get to Paul Freund. One, it might mean 
I believe in textualism and, and, and originalism, whatever, and I don't want to go look at the uh, purposes, and I don't want to look at values, and I don't want to look at the, that's what we should be doing. No, I say, why is that politics? Because that person got appointed to the Supreme Court because real political groups went around the country and tried to find individuals, usually judges, who really think that's the way to go. And the reason that they support that judge is because they believe that if you follow that kind of approach carefully and consistently, we will end up with law that they like politically. But aren't they right? Let's aren't be they honest. what? Aren't they right? I mean, if you look no, at... No, they might be right. I'm not saying they're wrong about that. I'm simply saying they think we're going to end up where we want politically. The judge isn't thinking that so much. The judge is thinking he's doing the right thing legally. And that's the one they're looking for. They don't want some judge who's going to go out there and be a politician. They want a judge who really will, in fact, believe that this is the way to approach the kinds of cases, let's call them animals, <laughs> call them what you want. But you see the idea? So the judge comes in responding to legal arguments. The judge comes in thinking, I'm right legally, but the people who got him appointed we don't care whether it's right legally or not. We're getting the result we like politically. Now that's, people don't take that into account. And I'm saying they should, that's one. Two. I'm going to interrupt for just a second, yeah. before, because we will get to all four, but I think no. it's important for me to drill down on something, which is I've heard from uh, members of the court who would be, let's, let's, let's use the political language, conservative justices. Amy Coney Barrett says we're not a bunch of partisan hacks. Justice Clarence Thomas says it's a mistake to see us perceived as partisan. Yeah. So in a way, this is a broadly... That's what they're saying. But, here's my, but, but, but is there enough introspection among the judges to recognize that the public perception has not stayed where the justices are yes. on their own? There is. Of what, course. What, That's the normal thought. The normal thought is the reason they're criticizing me or the reason they're criticizing somebody else they don't like the result. That's why. You're a Democrat. You don't like the result that attacks the very reasons that you're a Democrat, some of them. You're a Republican. You might like it. Yeah, of course. And everybody in the court knows that. And everybody in the court, I think, overstates. But they think that's what's going on, or at least in large part. So absolutely right. And uh, But still, they think... Our job, and this has much more weight than you think it does, our job is to decide this according to the law. And our way of going about it is a better way of trying to get the law right. You see? That's the mindset. And that uh, these groups over there think this is great for us politically, fine, let them think what they want. Or they think we hate this politically, let them think it. That's not our job to be politicians. It's our job to be judges. So that's one. You made a, a, a pretty compelling argument in 2021 in oral arguments in the Dobbs case. You quoted Alexander Hamilton saying, the court doesn't have either the sword or the purse. And so its public support comes primarily from people believing that we do our job. You said, we don't, we don't look to just what's popular. And you worried about a day when people would say, you're just political, you're just politicians, you said, and this is very memorable. That's what kills us as an American institution. Correct, because that's not our job. Are you afraid that things have gotten worse since then? Or well, all well, my audiences think so. Hmm. Uh, and do I think in terms of what they're thinking? Yeah, a little. But there's always been a tendency to think, I like it? Ah, brilliant. <laughs> Go ask the winning lawyer. What did you think of that judge? He's a genius. <laughs> go, go ask the losing lawyer. What do you think? Oh, he had a bad day. He had a bad day. Okay. So, so you see, this is a normal human thing. But remember just what you said. The judge is thinking, I can't say perfectly in all these things. Every, take with a, you know, what I say, take with a grain of salt, maybe a barrel of salt. But nonetheless, uh, 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 look, uh, I, I'm trying to get it roughly in your mind how I've seen it. And so uh, they're thinking we're doing this according to law. Uh, let's get to Paul Frank. We'll be there in a second. But there's a second thing, almost like the first, and, and you, you'll almost like this, but not quite. <laughs> it's called political science. 
You know, listen to Jeffrey Rosen yesterday. Pretty interesting. Those framers sat there and they got quite a lot out of Seneca. And Seneca was really a political scientist. And Cicero, Cicero really was. And they got quite a lot out of the uh, uh, French Enlightenment, the Scottish Enlightenment, John Locke. I mean, you know, political science talks not in terms of politics. It talks in terms of what politics is about. What is this country like? What is it really about? What is our government really about? Where are we going? You think judges don't think about that? They do. And if they come up with political science answers, that is not politics. It isn't politics, but I can see a degree of, not overlap exactly, but confusion. Three. I was, you got it right. I was born in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. This is my father's watch. It says on right in the back there, he worked for the San Francisco Unified School District as their advisor for 40 years. Yeah. He said the most important thing you can know if you're going to be working for a San Francisco school board or any school board or any public school, or you have to know a geography question's answer. A geography question? What's the geography question? Where is City Hall? <laughs> okay, got it, yeah. Anyway, that's how I grew up. And I went to Lowell High School, a public high school. And I went to uh, Stanford, you're right, and these other schools and so forth. Every one of us, by the time you've reached a certain age, has lived the life he or she has lived. And every one of us, after that period of time, has views. Views. What views? What's my job about, really? What is this country about, really? And you might not be able to articulate them, and you might not be uncer absolutely certain of them, and you might be, you might be, you might be, you might be, but they're there. And they'll jump out. You can't get rid of them. You try to, you can't. And I used to think, oh God, this is so awful. I mean, I did grow up in San Francisco and I did live in Cambridge, Mass for a long time. And here are these people down in Washington. There are a lot that don't agree with me. Why don't they agree with me who am so reasonable? Hey, please. But after a time, perhaps more maturely, I began to think, hey, this is a big country. It's a big country with people thinking a lot of different things. And it isn't such a terrible thing to have a Supreme Court, which is, after all, the only Supreme Court that we have in the country, except the states and so forth. But, but uh, look, not terrible if they think different things. Not as bad as I think it is when they don't think what I want. <laughs> but not so bad. I want to, and that's there. Now we're at Freund. Now we're at Freund. Okay. Okay. Four. <laughs> we're at Freund. And uh, remember, I am facing this very hostile audience. They pretend to be friendly, but uh, in their hearts, they think this is just a bunch of rubbish. It's all politics. That's friendly, but nonetheless, it isn't what I think. And now I've given you three things that are sort of politics, but they're not like politics in the Senate or Senator Kennedy or that executive session. So far? Four. Paul Freund got it as close as I can get it that I've read. He said... And this is why it's a tough question. What's a tough question? That public opinion. Mm. Why is it a tough question? I doubt that there is a person here who thinks if he were on trial in a criminal matter, and if he or she were unpopular at that particular instance, would you want a judge who decided according to public opinion? <laughs> Please. No judge, no judge does or should, if they're doing their job, decide according to the temperature of the day. But, part two, and here we have the problem. Every judge knows the temperature, no, the climate, yes, of the era. That sounds great. And if you figure out what it means, mm. you are ahead of me <laughs> because we spent, now I'll give you another example, that same, mm. that same phrase, that same idea. Uh, Robert Post has written a pretty good book about the Taft Court. I think it's a very good book. And Taft, who had been president, wrote a letter to Sutherland and he said, I hope that uh, new appointments to this court, he said, I understand they should know about law. This is after all a legal job, but, uh, I hope they know something about the higher politics. Mm. Ah, what's that? 
What's that? The higher politics. I'll tell you a couple of things. It isn't exactly. It isn't what was real politics. You want real politics in the Supreme Court? I take as an example, real politics in the Supreme Court is after, and I clerked there for Arthur Goldberg in 1964, and in 1964, the country's legal segregation had not ended. And what I felt I was in a court that their first and foremost, their first and foremost thought is how are we going to get Brown versus Board of Education 10 years before enforced? fully in the South, which of course never, North, South, I mean, we still have problems, but the legal segregation, Little Rock, Governor Faubus, the nine brave black children who got that court order to get into that school in 1957 Central High School, and uh, Governor Faubus there with the White Citizens Council said, you may have a court order, uh, yeah, but I have the state militia. And the moment when, the moment when, Hayes Brooks, Congressman, Arkansas, arranges a meeting. Falbus, President Eisenhower, Newport, Summer White House, he goes up, he says, okay, Mr. President, I'll let them in. He walks off. And he told your friends in the press, mm. you weren't born yet, <laughs> but still, yeah. he tells your friends in the press the opposite. Mm. Well, Eisenhower got pretty angry. So Eisenhower calls in people, what should I do? What should I do? And uh, Jimmy Burns, former member of the Supreme Court, he uh, quit in order to run the war effort uh, domestically. Uh, and he was governor of South Carolina, viewed as a moderate on race and uh, at that time. And uh, uh, says to Eisenhower, don't call in the army. He says, if you call in the army, you better be prepared for a second civil war, a second occupation. The best that will happen is they'll close all the schools. Nobody will, nobody, nobody will be educated. And um, what happened? A thousand troops, Fort Bragg, 101st Airborne, because Brownell, his attorney general, wise counselor, had said, send in the troops. It's a question of rule of law. And he sent them in, and they took those kids by the hand. They walked into the school. And I tell my classes, happy day, happy day for law, happy day for equality, happy day for the constitutional uh, uh, virtues and so forth, wasn't it? And they all say, yes. I say, no, it wasn't, because the troops couldn't stay. No, they couldn't stay there. And when they left... What did Faubus do? Close the schools. Read David Margolik's book on that, period. Black and white, those kids suffered. They suffered a lot. And a new case went to the Supreme Court, Cooper versus Aaron, and the Supreme Court said nine to nothing, integrate that school. And I say to the uh, Chief Justice of Ghana, who was in my office asking, why do people do what the court says? Ha, huh, why, nine of us. All nine signed that opinion. Great. There could have been 900. There could have been 9,000 judges. How do we get it enforced? Of course, it wasn't. They closed the schools. But, but, I say before now you think it's an unhappy ending, remember, by that time Martin Luther King was there. By that time the Freedom Riders. By that time the North had wakened and many in the South had to what that meant, that Jim Crow. Well, I know what it meant at the turn of the century, read E.B. Du Bois. But uh, boy, they couldn't do it. They couldn't keep it. They couldn't keep the segregation and slowly, but I want to tell this woman from Ghana, yeah, you're on the right track. But, the people, I, I wanna, I, but this wanna, is all your answer. It is, but I, I, do, I want to ask something that is yeah. about this question of, as you say, the fact <coughs> that people that nine individuals can have this effect. They can't. Well, but to the point that the court has a, a meaningful sense of, it has to have a sense of legitimacy in the world. Yes. And I think one of the things that has bothered people in recent years is the suggestion that there is an ethical problem at the court. Look, there's always been justices who have had issues in their lives, William Douglas, Abe Fortas, you can go back a long way. But in recent years, what we've seen is something slightly different, which are these cases of people taking gifts and 
going on trips and things like that, which feels if it would feel to some people like it is uh, beneath the standards of the court. Were you surprised by these cases? Do you think there's something the court should do? They instituted an ethics code last last winter. Were you? What did you think of that? That's. This would is you forgive me if maybe? I do this? I, I want to finish this thing Fair for enough. a reason. For a reason, because because I can't do it shortly. And I, I, I just the floor can't. Is yours. Because, and I will get to that next. I promise I will. But I, I want you to put your mind in this. And when I'm telling this woman, I'm telling her the Chief Justice of Ghana. I'm telling her, you want a rule of law? You've got to convince people who aren't judges. You've got to convince people who aren't lawyers. You've got to go to the towns, the villages. You've got to go to the cities. And you've got to convince the ordinary person that it is in their interest to follow law, including court cases, even when they disagree, and even when those cases might be harmful, and not, no, and even when they might be wrong. And of course, we would have thought very wrong about a lot of them. But if they're not prepared to do it, you don't have a rule of law. And when I'm at Stanford, I say that to the students there, and I say, no rocks thrown, Bush v. Gore, I thought it was very wrong. No rocks thrown, no riots. And you're thinking, too bad there weren't a few riots. Too bad there weren't a few paving stones. And I say, before you think that and decide that's right, turn on your TV set and see what happens in countries. Decide that way. Now, you see the kind of thing, the vagueness, the length that I have to go to to try to paint a picture of what it might mean to live in a country where enough people, you know, contrary to popular view, we have 330 million people and 329 million are not lawyers. Okay? They're the ones. They're the ones that have to see this. Like floating in the air. Like the atmosphere. Of course, with this case, we don't like it. We don't like it. But we are not going to, you know... This isn't rebellion. And he said, what about Hitler? Hitler was a different story. Okay? And, uh, all right, now, did you see? And that's climate of the era. Okay? Got it? The climate of the era. And the era changes. Why? I, I'm in law school. Uh, as a student, they're saying, oh, that Lochner case was terrible. What was Lochner? Lochner was the case of... Uh, Faulkner, a few others, turn of the century, 1900, around then. Unconstitutional. What? Minimum wage. Maximum hours. What a terrible court. Oh, wait. Read, read, read Alan Greenspan. Alan Greenspan tells us that this country, before the Civil War, was one of the poorest countries in the world. Not even the South. The South didn't get very far economically with slavery. Some places, yes, but most not. No, poor. Can't even afford churches. Not even schools in many places. Poor. But then read about the period from 1870 to the beginning of the First World War. We became the richest country in the world. The richest. And it wasn't just the robber barons. They were very, very, very rich. But <clears throat> the average person where he had been very poor was not quite so poor. And a little rich, some of them. And some failed, but most benefited. And why? Go ask some of those Harvard professors at the time. They said laissez-faire. They said property, contract. And it isn't surprising to me that Taft later ratified and said, yes, those words in the Constitution, contract, property, those things that uh, rule of law, yeah, that will save us. Save us? Save what? Save the goose. What's the goose doing? Laying golden eggs. Got it? That's in their minds. Era, climate. Now let's jump to the New Deal. Ha ha, you believe in laissez-faire in the New Deal, you're out of your mind. They're 24% unemployment. Is 94% fall in the stock market. There are the bread lines. What Roosevelt and I decided, what we liked was, of all of uh, Roosevelt's speeches, he says, try something. And if that doesn't work, try something else. But for God's sake, try something. Something, yeah. That's it. 
And anybody who believes that this is a golden egg, that this contract property alone have been laying there out of their minds. No. Somewhat different climate. Somewhat different era. Somewhat different court. Mm -hmm. Somewhat different court. Significantly different. Yes. Do you think that they have unwound the ability that was instituted during the New Deal for the agencies to provide that kind of involvement as the court overstepped what don't it should? don't know. You don't know, you said. And I'll tell you why I don't know in a second. But you want, what about the other big change? Earl Warren. Mm -hmm. Did I tell you the story? No, I didn't. Does some of you know Bill Coleman? Does that name mean anything to you? First black cabinet member that uh, uh, Gerald Ford appointed him Secretary of Transportation. Great man. He's a friend. Really liked him. Great man. And uh, in the Army, World War II, wants to go to the officers' club, they won't let him in. Goes to the base commander and says, they won't let me in the officers' club. Bill, says the commander, you really want to go in the officers' club? Yes. If you knew Bill Coleman, you'd say, of course he's going to say yes. Of course he believes yes. Commander says, you will. And he does. And there, you see that? Does that little story tell you something's changing in America? Something's changing to the point where it becomes a possibility. A possibility that we could get Brown. Brown versus Board. Whereas Holmes, 20 years before, said the same thing. He said, of course they don't let black people vote. Of course they don't. The law says they do. But the fact is they don't. And if we try to change that, you know what will happen? Nobody will pay any attention to us. He says that in the opinion. And he says, oh, it's a political question or something. Now, that's changing. It's changing. And we get to a point where Brown becomes possible. And it still takes 10 years, maybe 20 years, maybe 50 years more. Who knows? But we're getting there. We're getting there. And what's that? Those freedom riders, Martin Luther King, etc. Have I explained mm. what I think is in his mind when he calls the climate of the era? And then you come to your question. Mm. You see, and you say, "Well, are we in the midst of that right now?" And that, in my view, is the big question. Mm. Are we in the midst of that? Are we, whatever I, book I write, or whatever 19 books, or 4,000 books, or whatever they are, however powerful the arguments are in those books. No, I think they're fabulously powerful. But nonetheless, uh, uh, no matter how powerful, are we in it? And will we be unable to get out of it? In, in a minute, we're going to turn to questions from this audience. But I do have one question for you before we do, which is, if somebody in this audience reached under their chair and pulled out an envelope that said, congratulations, you've been nominated to the Supreme Court. What advice would you give that person? The same advice that President Sarkozy of France gave to his opponent, Madame Ségolène Royal, which I happen to hear. And she, he won partly on that basis. In French, it's the same as in English. He said he got her annoyed. He told a lot of things that weren't quite right. And she finally blew up. And he said, the second she blew up, he said, Mais calmez-vous, madame. Stay calm. You have to be calm when you're president of France. Yeah. You've, Advice that I would give that person? Calm down. You have eight other people. You have a difficult job. And the virtue of that job was what a president told me about such jobs. And he may have been, I don't know, well, anyway, he said, if you're appointed, remember this, the applause dies much faster. Than you. I remember Jeffrey Rosen in his terrific talk a couple of days ago about the classics. One of the great enduring pieces of wisdom is slow down, be less certain, less impulsive, consider the full long-term interests of yourself and of the interests at stake. Is that a piece of advice? Yes, I, well, I want them to do that. Them meaning members of the court? Yes, of course, because the virtue of the job, the virtue of the job is not the, the applause is not the virtue of the job. You go there and want applause, please, spare me. You're not going to get it. Hmm. And the big weapon I have in this book 
the most important thing for me, the most important hope that we do not end up in this change, this paradigm shift that I don't think is going to be helpful to America. Time. 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 You're there a long time. And soon you learn. You better learn. You better learn that the virtue of that job is not applause. The virtue of that job is for a long time, most of your life, most of your working life, you get to deal with cases that are difficult. You've got to give what you have. The first few years you thought, can I really do it? And then you say, well, I'm here. I have to do it. I have to give my best. That's all. Give my best. You think a doctor, when he sees a patient, with a disease he's seen 5,000 times before, he says, oh, I don't have to go really tough on this patient. I can be, not pay attention. Ha ha, no doctor says such a thing. And no judge should say such a thing either. You pay attention to this case and you give your best to it. And you pay attention to what your colleagues say too. Listen to them. Let them talk. Listen. You'll find some points of disagreement most of the time. Okay? Is there so that's what I say. I say calm down. And I'll tell you the greatest enemy, the greatest enemy to doing it is called the human ego. Mm. And anybody who thinks that they can control the human ego is never, never land. But you can sometimes keep it under control. So try. I imagine. Try. When you're and that helps. Is it possible... A question of time, and then we will go to the audience. But on this matter of time, it takes, as you say, it takes time. You, you, you be patient, move slowly. Um, are, is there any of the various proposals for term limits on members of the Supreme Court that you think are credible or deserve greater exploration? Term limits. Oh, term limits is different. Uh, the thing that uh, is, is goes around that I sort of negative uh, is. Uh, uh, in, in, bigger court or change the members. No, not or, expanding the court. No, I mean, because what one party can do, the other party can yeah, do. Yeah, for you know? sure. I mean, so, so but uh, I, for a long time, I've said I don't see any harm in having uh, a limited term, mm. but it has to be a long term. You don't want somebody in that job serving for a short time and thinking about what's my next job. They should uh, so be thinking 18 about years, climate, 20, not temperature. Yeah, that's yeah. 18 years, 20 years, I mean, fine. Most countries have such things. And uh, uh, that would not be, and it would prevent it would save a lot of agonizing over when am I going to retire. And uh, that would be great. <laughs> and well, is, you'd know when it was. But your, your question that I haven't answered, do, did I get, do you see what the, the, why it's so difficult to answer the, the, the Freud part? And yet how important that part is? Yeah. And how it is absolutely there. And how when you're there, the Supreme Court is different from other courts in that respect. Of course, public support's important. But you pay all your attention to getting public support, you're not doing your job as a judge. You're not doing your job, so you better be careful. And when exactly do you take it into account and how? And those are the difficult things, and that's so when I think. Hey. All right. Is it We've got time for questions, oral argument, you might call it. Uh, let's see where the microphone is. And we'll go right here into the front row if we've got a microphone nearby. Thank you. Um, Justice Breyer, thank you. Saw your talk yesterday. Loved it. Saw your talk today. Also really liked it. Um, so I'm a young person, just graduated high school, um, and thinking about going into law. Um, and you mentioned that um, Evan asked you about partisan politics. Um, and your response to the question was that judges just do what they think is right, and that they are appointed Please. by, and that they are appointed by their by their parties, um, because the parties think that they will act according, um, that their constitutional ideology will act in accordance to the party's values. As someone who's just graduated high school and might want an appointment or t in 10 or 15 years, why wouldn't I just um, pander to the rising tide of? Um, of originalism or textualism because that is the hot thing. If I know that that is what's going to get me the appointment, why wouldn't I just make that conveniently the thing that I believe in and the ideology that I used to, to rule on my cases? Doesn't then it become an inherently political thing um, if it becomes obviously advantageous for me as a 
you know, as an upstart, as a young person trying to make it big, um, to choose such a partisan, such a partisan ideology? That's a good question. Mm. I have a facetious answer. You want a facetious answer? Buy a ticket to the Massachusetts lottery. Mm -hmm. That's my father's second most important advice. You know, my father worked in the 30s and so forth. The advice he gave me, he said, best thing in your life, you do your job and do it as well as you can and pay some attention to other people. And if you do that, someone might notice and you might get a better job, mm -hmm. but they might not. And then you will still have the satisfaction of having your job done well. Yeah. And the reason you will be. And the reason that's what you're going to do, rather than this phony thing of pretending you're in a, whatever it is that you're not. You have parents, I hope, teachers, school, community, and they'll tell you about this country. And they'll tell you about other countries too. And that will develop within you an inner sense, which you will know if you have it. And it won't let you pretend you are a textualist if you're really not. And that's why you don't worry me. <laughs> and that's, and uh, uh, what was my father's first advice? That was his second. His first was stay on the payroll. <laughs> stay on the payroll. All right, we've got another question, I think, over there. Thank you. Thank you. I'm struggling with the concept of originalism contextually. Are today's originalists on the court constitutional originalists or biblical originalists? Is individual morality versing and overlapping law? No, it's constitutional. It's constitutional. The, the, the view of originalism, the, the, the case that I think well illustrates it is uh, uh, the gun case, the Bruin gun case. It was uh, two years ago uh, where New York has a law that uh, is uh, limiting, in the, very limiting, in the extent to which a person can carry a gun outside his clothing on the street in open. And they struck that down. And uh, uh, Clarence Thomas wrote the opinion. Uh, I wrote a dissent, uh, but uh, the view there uh, of the majority was look back and see if this kind of thing was illegal at the time of the founding when they wrote the Second Amendment. And if it wasn't, you can do it now. It's protected, something like that. And you look into history. I said in dissent. I said this history. I said in dissent. Ah, I say. You know, there are a lot of guns they had then or various things. I don't even know what they're talking about. I'm not a very good historian. I looked up the Hundred Years' War. They had things like skill ladders, haldebards, and Asian fire, which apparently they threw over the roof to burn up the city. I said, is that the foundation of artillery? I don't even know what a still a brand was. I don't know what a haldebard was. And a lot of judges don't, I hate to tell you. And we are not historians. So this isn't going to work. And also, your system is not going to let me look at the most important thing to me, is what are the consequences of this thing? And you go around and you look and you see thousands of policemen killed, thousands of spouses killed, thousands of children killed, thousands of etc. We all know that. And I'd say I think that's absolutely relevant to determining whether that Second Amendment, as applied today, gives you the right to put a gun under your pillow or gives you the right to carry guns in open uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm pretty much against that originalism. And the reason is because it doesn't work. And the key word for me, John Marshall, McCullough versus Maryland. In that constitutional case, not a biblical case, that's a different and more complicated matter. And you can say more important matter, it may be, but we're uh, deciding judicial things. But John Marshall says, this document, you know, I'm interested in the Bank of the United States. The question is, does it allow Congress to create one? You know what the Constitution says about Bank of the United States? Zero. But still, they can do it. Because that's how the Constitution works. It uses general words, look to the purposes, and be sure that it is in existence and continues to work. How far? Well into the future. 
That's what a constitution is. It will have to deal with problems that we can see dimly now, if at all. And to use that in appropriate places, to use that, to look for history for that purpose, look to history, look to what people thought then. I said this yesterday, I'll say it double because it's worth it. There were a large group of people, about half the United States, who did not participate in political affairs in 1787. You know who they were? Begins with a W, ends with an N. It's called women. All right? So the people who are taking those words in were not everybody in the United States. So there are many, many reasons. And I think consequences is a main one. And I think that uh, judges not knowing mm. is another important one. And that's all there in that originalism. Don't use it. And I say, but you have to use it. If you don't, that's beyond or part of what I meant when I said to, uh, to uh, Nino, I said, if we follow your method, we're going to have a constitution nobody wants. And that's not what John Marshall thought. And it's not what the Supreme Court thought when it wrote those words. It is a constitution we are expounding, Marshall's words, around the bottom floor of the Supreme Court. We've got another question right there. I uh, hope I can ask this coherently, but you talked about the era. Uh, an era seems to me a really a political era uh, where the, the politics of the country change. Is politics the answer to changing the direction of the Supreme Court uh, over time in that era, not reacting to the immediate, but is it politics that will do whatever it does to, to change the tenor of the court? That's, that's a good question. It's a very good question. Uh, and the word that you've left out, which I put in, only. Only. See, because most of those 28 years, I'm not dealing with politics. Most of those 28 years, the cases that we have, while very important to the individuals and to groups, are much more like animals. Case. Does the word for, in Internal Revenue Code, da 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 da, mean that the next word, which was a witch, should be interpreted as a witch or a that? Now we had a case like that, because hmm? they'd split in the lower courts on what the answer to that was. We had a case like that. I liked it. Nobody else liked it. But you see, they can be that or they can be Guantanamo. And what is it that's going to determine whether we do have a paradigm shift or not? And I can say yes, I can say no, I can say maybe. I can say yes, because I look at some of the recent cases last year and I think, oh my God, this is textualism on stilts. Okay. But not all, because I can look the other way and I can look at that gun case they had with spousal abuse. Can you take the gun away from the man who did abuse the spouse or threatens to? Court eight to one said yes. And of that court, which all said you can take the gun away, which, of course, to me, is it's common sense. Of course you can. But uh, there were five different views. Go back to your question. Five different views of what originalism meant or means. And I thought, well, they didn't get rid of it, but this is great. Because if they're having five different views, they're seeing a few problems with it. And everybody sees a different problem. And maybe they're seeing it isn't working too well. And one of those views was, well, you look to the principle underlying the word. Ah, oh, the principle. Ah, oh, and what is the principle? The principle is the purpose. The purpose. Hey, we're on the same track here. And I, and I see another judge there saying, we've got to do this by, through common sense. Okay. And uh, I, I think, uh, you see, it's a lot of things. And you asked the question, what about these changes in, in uh, uh, the administrative ethics. law? Yeah. Oh, ethics too. But uh, the administrative law, uh, uh, there are a lot of those. We're going to weaken. And that's been, by the way, a political matter since yeah. before Roosevelt. It was the Liberty League under Hoover Hoover. And what Roosevelt was quoted as saying is, the Liberty League thinks everything I do is wrong. Great, fabulous, I'll win overwhelmingly. And, and, and he did. And uh, uh, so we can't be sure. And, and I think I can read many of the cases they've written, like on Chevron, to say this is open. Mm. 
But that's a long story. And you asked about, well, what about the ethics problem? That is a different problem. And it's a problem because you cannot have a court that people think is unethical. You just can't. I mean, of course, of course it has to be ethical. Of course, that is a close question. But now, how do you do that? And there is really no difference. Well, that's debatable. But I think there's really no difference. Should there be an enforcement mechanism on the ethics code? Because there is not as of now. Nor is there for any federal judge. Should there be? Here's my problem. I already said it. We've got, I think. All right, what do you want? Do you want a court of judges who are independent to be beholden to some other person? Well, what if it was retired just justices, people of great standing, somebody I know might be available? Who and I, I, oh, you mean would it be me? <laughs> who could come in and say for the court that maybe you, you don't want look hamilton put this in he wants an independent group there i'll tell you a secret on the supreme court not elsewhere it is conceivable far be it from me to suggest anything mean about a lawyer <laughs> but if you get a lawyer gets you a judge off the case because of recusal, and you're in a lower court, you put on another judge, no problem. But if it's the Supreme Court, you can't put anybody else on, and you may, I'm not saying they'd have this as a motive, but they might. Let's change the result. Hmm. We'll get him off the court. So if you're on the Supreme Court, you have to have a duty to sit, as you do, as well as a duty not to sit. So what did I do? I explained it yesterday. I have seven volumes in my office. I used to be there. All right. Uh, seven volumes for federal judges of what's ethical and what's not. Somebody comes in, oh, these are hard, some of them, and they suggest you ought to recuse yourself, hey, look it up. And I do look it up, and I would in any case it wasn't relatively easy. Don't find it there, I call an ethics professor. That's their job, you know. And, and uh, uh, you get some pretty good ideas. Talk to your colleagues. And Nino talked to all of us when he had a tough case about uh, Cheney, when he went hunting with Cheney, and then there was a case that came up. Uh, tough cases, talk to your colleagues, talk to ethics professors, talk to, uh, but you want to give somebody the power to control the, to control the um, makeup? of the Supreme Court, I begin to get a little nervous. That's and I begin to understand why, if you read that Constitution, it provides one penalty for judges who misbehave or maybe don't. It's called impeachment. It's called impeachment. And that applies to all federal judges, not just the Supreme Court. And uh, I, I, I used to be chief judge at one point of the uh, First Circuit. And uh, we got a lot of cases, a fairly few that would come in, somebody could file a complaint. You should recuse yourself, somebody should recuse. So I give it to the circuit executive. He goes through it. He does a kind of triage. And I look at these, and very few are serious, real problems. Some are. Two were real problems. One, a friend of mine, good lawyer, you know who it is, I won't tell you. He went into judge's court, behaved according to the judge, badly, and the judge says, you're never coming in my court again. So immediately files an ethics complaint. Well, he's right. <laughs> and the judge can't say that. And uh, so we considered it, and I thought it was wrong, and so did the other appeals judges, and we wrote him a letter and said this was wrong. He, didn't tr he wrote back a letter of apology. Another case more serious, sexual abuse. The judge said no. The woman said yes. I got a group of uh, good lawyers. They went down there and looked into it. They thought the answer was yes. The judge got a lie detector. We still thought it was yes. We went down and had a hearing, and the judge resigned. Uh, there are a lot of weapons. There are letters. There's the press. It's helpful in this instance much of the time. <laughs> well, we'll and, take uh, much. You see, you see, take and so, so uh, do you see where I am not a little nervous about putting other people in charge of what the composition of that court is? That I understand. It's consistent with your idea of go slowly, I think. I think, folks, um, we are, we're being told it's time's up. If we can, if we could do this fast, we'll do the last question right here in the second row, and then we'll It we'll seems to go. me 
number of years since we left King George the Third, and I wonder if you could help us understand the uh, immunity decision recently of the Supreme Court, particularly in light of the fact that the lower court had made a decision, the Supreme Court had the chance to yeah, refuse yeah, yeah. taking that case. You see, so I, help us understand that. I, I don't know that I can help because I have a, maybe, I don't know how common my view is on this. Look, the, the key sentence that I found in the majority opinion, what I think they're worried about, or I think the majority, Chief Justice wrote the majority, was the cannibalism sentence. See, what he's afraid of, I think, this is just me, I didn't ask him. You know, what I think he's afraid of is that well, we have uh, X, President X, uh, bringing a lot of criminal cases against his predecessor. And then we have the new President Y, and he's out and he brings cases against his predecessor. And pretty soon you have cases and cases and cases, and God only knows what will happen. We better deal with this now. That wouldn't have been my view. My view probably would have been, but I hesitate because having a view means you better read the opinions of the past, you better read the briefs, you better sit down and talk, you better listen, da, 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 all that's true. So I hesitate, but I'm cautious about this. And I think that mistakenly, most people think that we have two political branches and we have a court, which is supposed to be, and is pretty much, non-political. And if they get into political fights, the court should be the referee. I don't believe that. I believe that's not what the courts are about. The courts are primarily about solving human problems where there aren't other solutions. And they've come into court to try to get over their argument. And uh, believe me, the politicians, I think, have loads of solutions for their problems. You try standing up to Congress or you try standing up to the president. They have many weapons. It isn't our primary job. And you know, it's been over a hundred years before there haven't been earlier cases on the subject you mentioned, maybe one, but, or maybe two or three, but very few. Good. When you get a quick case, that's a big political case that's going to move this country. Sometimes you have to decide it, but try not to. Try to decide it minimally. Try to decide it in ways that will leave as much as possible outside the realm of your decision so that we can develop, find out what will happen. Who knows what that case will mean or do 50 years from now? And to me, the answer is nobody knows. So be careful. Be careful. And, and you see, uh, you may feel I haven't answered your question, uh, but that's, that's, that's a view I have of it. Mm. That's the view I have of the court. And uh, the first thing I usually tell the students, ever have any arguments? Brothers, sisters, parents, yeah. Did you get over it? Yeah. Always? Yeah. But sometimes people don't. Sometimes it's money or a crime or something. Go, who do you go to? The judge? No. The lawyer. And the lawyer tries to get over the Keppel problem. You try to get around that argument, get over it. Sometimes you can't. Then you go over to the courthouse. And then you walk up the steps. And you know what you do in the steps? You settle the case. But a few get through. Okay? You got through. And now we have courts to try to help people get over those arguments, try to resolve them when they couldn't on their own. And you say, is that your primary job? Or is it trying to resolve disputes among politicians? Well, you know my answer. That's the job. Disputes among politicians, sometimes you have to. But be careful. Be careful. Careful but not hesitant. That's what we promised. Folks, please join me in thanking Justice Breyer for his comments today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.